This is exciting. My name is Cheryl Falston. I'm the secretary of the Mesilla Valley Audubon Society, which is in Southern New Mexico. We are the sponsors of tonight's workshop and we're so excited to have people not only from New Mexico, but apparently all over the world taking part in this workshop. I learned about nature journaling from Jack early in the pandemic. I wrote an article about him for the magazine that I published called Neighbors Magazine. And I kept telling him we wanted to do a workshop for the Mesilla Valley Audubon. So we finally worked it out where we said that we would do it sponsored by the Mesilla Valley Audubon, which as a, any Audubon chapter does, we do bird walks, we have monthly programs and educational programs and advocacy for birds and wildlife. But we, we agreed that we would open it up to anybody and this is succeeding beyond my wildest imaginations that we have people from so many different places in the world. So we are gonna be talking about sketching for birder, birders and nature journaling. And John Muir Laws is one of my heroes because he has taken his passion and worked so hard on it himself, but brought it to people all over and allowed them to enjoy it and appreciate it and to have a deeper relationship with nature. So I'm really excited to turn this over to John Muir Laws. Well, thank you so much. I'm really delighted to, to be here. Um, if you are in the Las Cruces area and you are not currently a member of the local chapter of the Audubon Society, I want um, just put into the chat uh, their website and you can find out all about them. Uh, getting connected with local birders is really a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, birding is one of the things that we can do safely, uh, socially distance, um, although it is sometimes challenging to look through bird uh, your binoculars because the masks seem to uh, fog up our binoculars. But still, when we're near other people, that's what we got to do. Um, but I want to encourage people to um, reach out and connect with your local chapter of the Audubon Society or bird conservation organization in whatever spot on the globe you are. This bird stuff is really fun. Actually, what I'm going to do is I realized I can. Hi, this is me. <laughs> That's actually who is talking. Um, and uh, so um, but 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 birding with 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 uh, with with community is really really wonderful. We still have to be careful um, to take care of our own health and that of our neighbors. Um, but uh, but it's it's a, also a, it's a terrific way to also connect with with local conservation efforts. The things which we do to help birds. Uh, ripple out into helping all sorts of other species. And also thinking about birds really helps people think across boundaries and borders. Um, birds can fly and their migratory bird routes go right across those dotted lines we've put on our maps. Um, and the so when we're thinking about their conservation, that is something that really also helps us sort of see connections to other parts of the world, other people in other parts of the world, and other birds in other parts of the world. Um, so delighted to be here with you. I'm John Muir Laws, and I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of tricks to help you be able to draw birds. Um, if you have my book on how to draw birds, um, it is mostly still the process that I use. However, the basic one, two, three approach of how I go about now sketching a bird has changed since that bird, that, that book came out. So I think I've got a better way. I'm going to be showing you that. Um, and um, my goal is today that everybody here, when you are out in the field and you see a cool bird pop up, you're going to be able to make a quick little sketch of it. And a little sketch that you make is going to look like that bird sitting out there on the wire. And that's really useful to us because if you're going out and you don't know what this thing is, or you don't have a bird book with you, I, um, when I bird in unusual areas, my MO is to go not out in the field with my bird book. Um, because 
what I find I sometimes tend to do is once I identify the bird, I kind of go like, oh, I now know what this is. And there's a little part of my brain that goes like, I can stop really looking right now. But if I go like, I don't know you, I don't know you, I don't know you, what are you, what are you, what are you? And it really kind of gets my curiosity deeply hooked. I'll look and look and look and look and look at that bird. And I can document everything that I can about it down on my little piece of paper. And um, it's a wonderful way of getting yourself just to look more carefully. So even if you know a bird, you'll find that if you make some sketches and drawing of, drawings of it, you're going to learn that bird so much better. So I'm going to show you my fast approach to sketching birds. And then um, I am going to um, kind of get into a little bit of the details kind of around that. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. First, let me kind of show you um, my most recent uh, sort of big birding adventure. Um, this is a, I had an opportunity to go to Ecuador and look at the, the birds there and was just blown off my pins by beauty and biodiversity and <laughs> they do bright birds. <laughs> They do bright birds, right? So I want to show you that. And you're going to see that these, I'm going to be showing you some sketches that I did. These are made in the field, not from photographs. Um, and kind of what that, that, that looks like. And then I'm going to unpack the process of, um, of, of how that works. And also, as this is going along, if anybody has um, questions, you can type those into the chat. We have disabled uh, people's ability to unmute themselves because sometimes that just happens by accident. And we, um, there also are some rascally Zoom bombers out there, and this keeps them all in check. But if you have questions, you can put those into the chat. Shell's going to be monitoring those and feed those to me. We also will be addressing some of those at the end. So let's first just take a look at um, some bird sketches. So this is a nature journal um, with a ballpoint pen and watercolor. And, of, and what you're seeing here going on is that there's a bird that is popping around in the bushes in front of me. And what I'm doing is I am making multiple sketches of these birds. So instead of just trying to do one portrait head to toe, if I start on this drawing and then the bird moves, you know, if I say to myself, I'm just going to wait till you come back to this position, somehow the birds can tell. And, and they never do. But if I bounce around from one drawing to another, to another, to another, to another, then as the bird moves, so do I. And the drawing that I get the furthest along on is just sort of ends up being the most characteristic posture of that bird that I saw on that day. Um, so if you, uh, look at these sketches here. Sometimes I'm making sort of uh, quick, just sort of posture sketches. Sometimes a bird is really cooperative, though this bird here was, it just, it, it hung out on a feeder in front of me. Feeder birds in Ecuador look like that. That's crazy, right? Um, Here's uh, more examples of it. Some birds are more cooperative than others. Um, but uh, so these are, are sort of essentially you know, feeder birds that were, were, were popping up in front of me and I was, was sketching them on the go. I'm going to zoom down on one of these pages here. We'll see, first of all, if this zoom function works. And what I want people to, we'll see if we can actually see this, all right? So here's this sort of weird looking bird, but what I want people to notice is these little sort of light lines out here around the bird, all right? See these ones out here? Not the big bold ones, but these little kind of light lines you're seeing around the edges of the bird. You see the same thing going on here. If you look in the background behind this bird, there's sort of a light ghost drawing. And that ends up being really important in this process. You see, if you just sort of sit down with, with, with a bird, let's see, if 
you just sort of sit down with the bird. You try to just from, from head to tail, um, draw this thing. It's moving around and it is really, really difficult to get these details and the basic shape of the bird at the same time. So what I do is when the bird pops up, I make a light, let's see, zoom down on that again. I make a light kind of a ghost drawing and that blocks in the bird's basic shape. And I make notes on top of that. When the bird flies away, I then am able to fill in those notes from, whoops, there's a bird, fill in those notes from um, either memory or from written notes that I put around that bird. So let's take a look at how I kind of assemble these birds in my head and on a piece of paper. Let's see, here's my hand and we are going to scoot back. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna show you kind of what my kind of initial starter lines. We're gonna make kind of a generic bird together. And then we're gonna modify that plan to be a whole bunch of different birds. And you're gonna see how this basic plan, um, you can, with a little tweak here and there, you can get all these different sorts of shapes of birds. And then the decorations that you put across them, um, you know, the field marks um, are the, the details that go in, but you first need sort of a, a scaffolding, the blueprint of how the bird looks. So what I do when I first see a bird is I look at the shape of the air behind its head and its back. So this is a bird that's sitting here, its head is up slightly, kind of the way that robins like to hold their head, bluebirds like to do that too. A lot of birds you'll see them with their head up. And so what I do is I look at the shape of the air that is back here behind the bird's head. And I'm gonna suggest that everybody kind of draw this sort of set of angles down on your piece of paper. The next thing that I do is I look at how big the bird's head is compared to its body. Small birds tend to have big heads and big birds tend to have small heads proportionate to their bodies. So what I do then is I go like, oh, you're sort of a medium sized bird. I'm gonna put in a medium sized head here. And the bird's head is gonna be right in here. And I put in a little oval for my bird's head. And I do this kind of lightly, I do this loosely. I'm, and you notice I'm making sort of multiple lines and kind of drawing over those. That gives me my bird's head. I then, my next line is, I'm gonna put in a little line through, it's what I call the eye beak line. So the bird's eye and beak line up on this line. We'll kind of get into some of those details in a little bit. But for now, my bird is looking this direction. And then the next step that I do is I look at the shape underneath its throat and just the start of its breast, so this zone of the bird. So my bird has, in, on the, the one that I'm imagining, has a little throat that comes down and then it, its body angle changes and it kind of goes out. There's a little bit of a, a chesty, a chest in there. So this, this angle here in the back and this angle here in the front, front are going to be different on different depending on the way that the bird perches. Let me just go for a few examples in here. So for instance, this bird sitting here, this one has a medium angle in front. And notice that the throat here is coming down fairly flat, right? This one here, fairly kind of a, a curve here in front, a little bit in back, but this bird's back is really pretty kind of in line with its, it's, it, it's head and back, so it's not really sticking up as much as, 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 as others. Let me just bounce to a different bird for a moment. All right, so here's a little tanager. So the back of its head comes down this angle, so that would be my first line. My second line would be you've got a head that is roughly this big, kind of a medium-sized shape in here. And then I just look at this shape here, kind of going into the throat and just the start of the chest in there. Those are my three first, or with, that, with the, I guess the four first lines. 
including that little line of which way the beak is pointing. Let's just look at maybe a couple other birds. Right, so angle on the back of the head to the back. How big your head is, you give it a bigger bird head for a smaller bird. And then the angle right in, as your throat kind of curves into the chest. So that's how I kind of work my way into, into a drawing. Again, that angle on the back, head, ball, peak, and that angle on the chest. Once I've got that, I'm now ready to sort of build out the rest of this drawing. But the reason that I focus on these two lines the most at the very start of a drawing is that as the bird is moving, these are the lines that are going to move the most. And if I get this line right and this line right, this bird's head will fit into its body. The bird's going to feel like it works. I'll show you another very common posture that you get. Some birds, instead of having the head tilted up like this, you'll see they'll sit with their back fairly straight. Their back and their head are kind of all sort of along one straight line. So let's put a head in with this one. Let's give this one a bigger head, like we might find on a verdant um, or a chickadee. And I'm going to say on this bird, its throat angle is just, there's no real kind of chin that I'm seeing. It's just coming straight down from that. Here is its, its beak. Right. So this is sort of another way that you'll often find birds, sort of their posture working up, either head up or head down. Once I've got those lines, I'm then going to give my bird a body. And from this point on, the bird is going to start to feel like a bird really pretty fast. Um, what I do is I put in a little oval here that tucks in, in back of the back, under the head there, and into that sort of front of the chest. So I essentially give my bird a little egg that sits down in there. Let's put one in here too. This kind of gives me the chunkiness of the body. The bird's tail is attached to sort of a flexible, bit of bone and tissue at the back here. Um, I like to sort of think of the tail as kind of insert, so the tail can, that, that bone can move up and the tail can be flipped up. The bone, tail can be pointing down um, at all sorts of different angles. But, the, but you think of the, the little kind of the, the point that where it pivots from is sort of being inside this oval. So I'm not drawing it like here's my bird, Oops, let's bring that back down onto the screen. Oh, Cheryl, by the way, if I start drawing off the screen, just do let me know. So I'm not sort of drawing a bird and then the tail kind of is going to bend from the backside right here off that circle. It's gonna actually pivot from a point inside the body of the bird. So for this little bird here, I'm gonna give it here. I'm gonna move this bird's tail. It's gonna be down at an angle like this. Sometimes it's parallel to the back. Sometimes it's up. Now let's do this one up. This is a bird that's feeling a little bit perky. Um, there's sometimes a little wad of feathers and tissue on just sort of the base of the tail there. Sometimes I will give my bird a bonus little ball right there where the, the, the tail attaches. Let's put that a tail on this one here. This one, um, let's, let's, let's actually cock this tail up high. And we're going to put a little ball of fluff right there behind it. So this builds out the basic bird body. Now I need wings and legs. So the wing can either droop down this way or be tucked up tightly on the back. The same bird can move its, hold its wing in different ways. And also because the, the, the front part of the wing that you see is actually the bird's wrist. That birdie wrist can um, be held at any sort of point anywhere kind of in here very easily. 
So the bird kind of takes its, its, its wing, it'll put its wrist in here the next time, it might be over here. So exactly where the wing seems to start will be from somewhere in here. And as you look around on different birds, that's gonna be in different places on different birdies. Um, so, but I'll notice from somewhere in here, and then my wing is going to, this one is going to hold its wing. Uh, this one here, we'll have this wing uh, held up tight on the back. And this one, let's droop it. When I'm sketching wings, I'll often start with just that line of the wing. And then I will put on that just a ball, kind of a long oval to be the sort of the body of the secondary feathers and covert feathers. If you sort of studied bird anatomy, um, those terms make sense to you. Um, but if you are just, if it's the first time you've heard those, let me just kind of go to a bird drawing here. Um, um, bird wings often have a pile of feathers that are called secondary feathers. And then sticking out from that is a little small wedge of feathers called primary feathers. So on different birds, the primaries and secondaries can be different lengths. Here, this big ball is my coverts and secondaries. So that's that big ball I'm making. The front edge of the wig, the primaries, on this bird, it doesn't have long primaries sticking out, um, kind of just this little thing sticking out here. So kind of a quick shorthand for an effective bird wing is to think of, to think of kind of an, an oval of feathers. And we'll get more detailed in that with a little wedge sticking out the back of it. So here is, I'm gonna just grab my pen here and uh, kind of noodle out this, this, this wing. Actually, let me, let me first put wing, the secondary feathers on these guys. So this one here, it's gonna have kind of a ball of feathers in here. And then the front part of the wing there. This one here, because it's folded up on its back, it's gonna be a narrower, skinnier ball. This one here, because it's opening this wing up and drooping it down, I'm drawing a, a deeper ball this way. And essentially what is going on there is that upper ball of wings is the secondary feathers and the, the secondary coverts. And that makes sort of a box of feathers on the back the top front edges of that have these curving sets of smaller feathers called covert feathers that go around those. And then the primary feathers stick out behind that in a little wedge. Different species, the feathers here, the primary feathers stick out to different lengths. But um, so that's also something you can look at when the bird is in front of you or at your feeder, does it have short primary extension or long primary extension? Something like this green honey creeper here, you see that black part there, that's a lot of primary sticking out there. Um, other birds like this crazy character here um, has just a little bump of primary feathers that are sticking out here. So there's sort of a wad of secondaries, a little bit of primaries out. This one here is somewhere in between. We'll get more into some wing details in a little bit. I don't wanna to get too far ahead of myself and kind of go deep dive on wing, but we will go there. Now we're gonna just put some feet in on our birds and um, birds have hips, knees, and ankles, and toe joints, just like you do. You kind of go from your leg down, you've got hip, then knee, your ankle, and then you've got your toe joints. Let's see what that looks like on birds. The hip is buried in the feathers somewhere about here. The knee is buried in the feathers somewhere about here. So there's from hip to knee. To go out to the heel, there's its shin bone traces back like this. So the feathers, the bone comes forward and back kind of like this. I'll just lightly draw it in here to a knee to back like this. Sometimes you see a little bit of the bird's heel sticking out. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you don't, the feathers cover that up with fluff. But from that heel joint, 
the bones come forward. That's the tarsus of the bird. And then its feet kind of hang uh, attached to that. So from some point sort of in the back third of the bird here, you're going to have a leg bone coming forward onto the bird's foot. Birds have three toes that go forward, one toe that goes back. We'll get into drawing details of birds' feet in a little bit later in the talk. For now, I'm just going to put in a little ball where that bird's foot is going to be hanging on to a branch. Let's give it another foot. I'm going to draw that one at a little bit more of a forward angle. And I'll be sitting on a branch. Let's give this little one down here one. It's going to have from a hip to a knee to a heel. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of foot sticking out, and then its foot is going to be in this area here. So that is, that's my sort of bird, my bird frame, my quick bird frame. Let me just walk through that one more time more quickly. And you're going to see these sort of, these same steps just, just sort of repeated, repeated again. The first thing that I do is I look at what is the angle on the back of my bird. This one, its head and its back are going to all be on the same line. I then say, oh, what is your, how big is your head? This is a, this is a larger bird with a smaller head. Which way are you looking? What is the shape in front of your throat? This one is gonna come down. I'm gonna give it a little bit of an angle in there. So those are my first four lines. From there, I'm putting a ball in for the body of the bird. This one's tail is gonna be coming down. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a lump of tail feathers. And what about this one's wing? This one's wing is gonna be tucked up. So it's gonna start somewhere in here. And so I'm gonna give it a more sort of compressed bubble of feathers, of secondary feathers on top of that. This one has its leg really folded up. So it goes from hip to knee to heel. And then its foot comes forward here. This one's a little bit cold, so I'm gonna fluff it out a little bit more. And so its foot is kind of coming in here. It's sitting on a branch right here. So it's, it's, its leg actually comes up inside here. So sometimes you don't see this part of the leg. You just see the bottom of the bird coming down. And the foot seems to be stuck on the bottom of that. That doesn't mean the birds have small legs. In some cases, it does. So if you're looking at hummingbirds, hummingbirds have tiny, tiny, tiny little legs. Sometimes you can't see the feet at all. You sort of see this this hummingbird sitting there, and like there's, there's, no, there's no feet. Actually, the scientific name that includes the group that includes birds, I mean hummingbirds, the name for it of that scientific group is apodiformes. <laughs> and that, that translates to uh, <clears throat> the ones without feet. A without pod feet. So this is my kind of my, my basic framework. And when the bird pops up, I, that's what I'm sketching first. And um, Another thing that I'm doing as I'm doing this is I am actually talking out loud. I'm talking out loud to myself. Uh, because when this bird flies off, I want to be able to remember details of its plumage. And if I just look at it, to look is to forget. To speak involves more parts of your brain and will help you remember the details that you see. So if this one has um, a, uh, a, a stripe by its eye on a stripe on its forehead, I could, um, you know, uh, I, could, I could make a little line in here and put stripe. Another line on the forehead, stripe. Can you move your sketch paper? Oh, down? thank you. Ah, that's why it takes two, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so uh, what I'm doing is I'm just noticing, you know, what it is. Um, the, 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 the throat here. Uh, oh, there's a yellow patch in here. Um, the throat is white, um, sort of overall kind of brownish, um, uh, this sort of gray brownish. I'm putting little, uh, this is brown, B-N, uh, stripes. 
Um, there's a white wing bar. Somewhere in here. So I'll, I'll, I'll add little written notes all over my bird. Um, this is short. Thick. I say these things out loud, and then I've got a chance of remembering those details. If instead I just look at the bird and assume that I'm going to remember how it looks, what I find is that later on, I'm thinking to myself, how did that bird look? I really don't remember. So um, I, that's why I add in all these little written notes. And if you look at a bunch of my sketches, you can actually see, let's zoom down on this little hummer here. Um, you can see this little kind of little chicken scratch in here. That says pink. This says copper. This says buff. All right. Um, so I'm adding little notes in that help me be able to do that. You can see the same thing kind of going on here. There's little written notes, and it, it just has to be light enough that for, uh, for me to be able to read that soon. On this one here, look at this. What is this? That's the word green scrawled across there. But it ends up looking like some little bumps in the feathers. Um, this is GY uh, for gray. So I use a little two letter code that I made up, the first and the last letter of the color. Um, not the first and the second, because otherwise brown and, uh, 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 so, so, so green and gray would be confused with each other. Um, black and blue would be confused with each other. So there would be, but if you use the first and the last letter, then you're in much better shape. For reds and yellows and whites, I just do an R or a W or a, or a, or a, or a Y. So there's a little R pointing to its eye. This one has a red eye. So making those notes while the bird is in front of me is really useful. So what I'm not doing usually is I'm not looking at the bird, trying to identify the bird and then looking it up later in the field guide to see where all those colors go. Um, I find it's much more interesting to try to kind of get this thing down and see what I can learn by, by sort of live observations on this bird. Then I've got a template that I can start to draw right on top of. And that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to take this little bird and I'm going to, to, to fill it out. Um, I was, um, I recently had an, an opportunity to see a white-throated sparrow. And it was this really, really cool bird. <laughs> and, and so that's what I'm going to turn this one into here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to draw on top of this little framework that I made and sort of show you how I would make some of those more um, uh, detailed lines. Oh, um, Kim is asking an interesting question. Um, Kim is asking, so why did you make this change um, from your, your approach to drawing birds? And the reason is, Kim, that um, I found that this negative shape behind here and the one in the front were so crucial for getting the feeling of the bird, the shape that that bird gets. But sometimes, because that was uh, eventually sort of became, came along later, kind of looking at those negative shapes, I would look at that later in my process. Sometimes the bird had even flown off by then. And my drawings weren't really feeling as right. And getting this head to sink into the body and fit with the body was such an important part of making that work. So therefore, I, I, I changed my approach. <clears throat> um, and I still get all the same basic information, but I get to the critical lines more quickly. 
Once I have this framework on there, I can now start just to kind of work in, in more detail. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give my little birdie here a beak and different types of birds have different shaped beaks. Um, sparrows and finches have little triangular beaks, really cute little triangular beaks. And that's what I'm gonna give this little bird. Notice that that line in the middle of the mouth, I didn't bring it all the way out to the tip of the beak. That's a really cool trick. Um, it ends up looking better if you don't go all the way out there. It ends up looking really cartoony if you kind of go like this. But you just sort of imply that that guy goes out there and your beaks will look better. The next thing I do is I look at how much space do I have between the back of the beak here and the eye. The eye is going to be closer to the front of the head than you think it should be. And it's going to be right on that little line, that first little eye beak line that you drew in. It's going to sit on top of that line. So this bird's eye is going to be back here. I'm going to draw in a little circle. And now I'm going to think about what is the angle on the forehead so that um, some birds like a, a meadow lark will have a slope all the way back here. Some birds will have a steeper forehead. Um, and this one is sort of medium, and it's coming up to a crest somewhere up here. And then I'm going to drop it back. So I like to think of what is the angle on that forehead. Um, if the bird's flown away and I don't see any of this information, it's okay just to make it up and just do the best you can with what's there in your memory. But if that bird is still around and, and cooperative, then what you do is you look back at the bird and, and you see like, okay, oh, that's what it's doing. That's particularly um, useful, particularly useful if you're looking at birds that you're just sort of structurally you're not familiar with. All right. Um, now let's go uh, attach this, this head uh, into the body here. On some birds, especially if they're feeling warm, the head, back, the back of the, the head is just sort of a nice even slope right down there. However, if this bird is feeling kind of chilly, and this bird is, then very often kind of the lower back of the neck will puff out a little bit. That's what's called the nape. And you'll often see just a little kind of puff in there in the nape. My throat's gonna come down and I come into my chest feathers here. Um, I like to, I'm going to turn my, my, my drawing a little bit so it's easier for me to make kind of these angles. I like to kind of suggest that there's just a little bit of kind of light fluffiness as you come around the kind of the front of the chest here. And then as you kind of go back here, the feathers get bigger and bigger and bigger and increasingly shaggy towards the rear here. And so I'm going to come down here and I'm going to put in kind of a, a suggest that there's some shagginess here by just a little line drawn like this. And then I'm putting my pencil or my pen in here on the page and I'm flicking it forward. And what that does is just sort of make some, some little lines that are bigger towards the back and smaller as they would, as they go this way, as you would see if you were looking at a, um, if you were looking at kind of cracks in the feathers there. So this is my breast. These are my flank feathers down here. Now I'm going to jump up to, actually maybe what I'll do is I'm gonna play with the head just a little bit more. So remember that stripe over the forehead? Um, Move down a little bit more, Jack. Oh, yes, <laughs> let's, let's, let's actually give our bird a, give my bird a little bit more of the forehead there. All right, I'm going to go up here across the top of its head and give this bird a line of feathers high above its eye. The bird also has another set of feathers that goes through its eye. And so, Actually, before I do that, I'm going to lightly suggest 
a ring of feathers around its eye like this kind of makes the bird look a little bit sleepy. The birds have these sort of rings of feathers right around their eye. And this bird has a line of feathers that comes back from the eye and kind of blocks out towards the back. For the eye itself, I'm going to just suggest there's a little place where the sunlight is hitting and the rest of the eye is going to feel kind of dark. But you notice I put in that little suggestion of where my light was first. Birds have a little patch of feathers right over their ear. And it kind of connects up to the corner of the mouth. And so this bird, I'm going to give it a little light patch of feathers over its ear. A little patch of feathers over the nape. As I'm doing this, what I'm my, my, my pencil or pen strokes are just kind of imagining that this is a rounded form and I'm kind of carving around that form. You see how those lines sort of come down and just sort of suggest that we're there's a rounded form here. So those lines are wrapping around. If I do this all straight, then it doesn't feel like about a rounded bird. This bird has a white throat. And a little bit of yellow above its eye. So this was a bird that I watched from a feeder and it was just hopping around on the ground underneath the feeder. So it was extremely cooperative. If birds aren't cooperative, you, I just end up not being able to spend as much time with them. But the ones that really are cooperative and showing up for you, show up for those birds. Really give them some love, some time and attention. So don't wait for the rarity to show up to kind of go deep on something. But any bird that is being, you know, if it shows up for you, then just give it, really give it the time of day. Let's give this bird a wing. Before I put in the wing, I have to make sure though, this bird has enough back. So before you, the wing doesn't start up here by the neck, there's actually a little bit of birdie back that is up in this area here. And Birdie's got back. I'm gonna leave a little bit of room for that. So here's where my, what, what's going to be my uh, scapular feathers and my, my sort of back or mantle feathers. It'll be up in this area. And I'm just gonna lightly suggest that that is darker brown as well. Just a lighter pressure on my pencil. There will be patterns in these, and I'll put that in towards the end. Now the wing. Um, remember the wing. What we did before is I had that first line in the front of the wing. I had that ball of feathers in the back. That kind of gives me my basic mass of my wing. I look at how far out my primary feathers stick out from that. Did they really long? Want to see really long ones? If, if they're crazy long on hummingbirds. Um, hummingbirds just have primary feathers for days. So on a, on a hummingbird, hey, there's a hummingbird. Um, these are the secondary feathers in there, that mass, that ball of feathers. And this whole thing is the primaries. <laughs> So they're basically all, all primary feathers. Um, but that's, that's not the case on this sparrow. There's a little kind of nugget of it. There's also towards the front of the wing what are called covert feathers, which is an Oop, arch. Moved in again, Jack. Oops, thank see. you. You're welcome. Um, an arch of feathers that goes across the front of the wing that um, is the, um, that composes sort of layers of smaller feathers. Um, if I am, am drawing something quickly, I will often just suggest in my, my drawing a little bit of the detail. So here's, here's a sketch you can see that I, I made. There's a, a bird that I saw out in the desert. And its wing is 
there is, you can sort of see a little hint of here's the covert feathers going across it. Here are the secondary feathers coming in here like this. Here's the primary feathers sticking out underneath that. A little bit of a suggestion of the edges of some feathers coming down this way, which is the direction that these feathers do come. But what I haven't got done is kind of gotten in here and drawn in every feather. On a bird that is much more cooperative, um, I'm able to draw in, oh, let's just sort of see um, you know, here on this bird, we're seeing the same thing, that there's a suggestion of that there's some covert feathers up in here. Here are secondary feathers in here. Here are primary feathers sticking out underneath that. Here in this one, secondary feathers in this arch. I'm sorry, covert feathers, covert feathers, secondary feathers, the primary feathers sticking down behind that. Same, same. Sometimes if the bird is really cooperative, um, I will get more information. Let me see if I can find one of those like this. This was a very cooperative bird and it had little dark edges in some of the secondary, the covert feathers and in the secondary. Um, but I don't, I often don't get all that detail. So not overdoing the detail on the wing is a very good thing. Let me get a little bit more detail on, so actually let me first do that on, on this demo wing here and then I'll put that onto my step. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have this, suggestion of covert feathers in here. Notice I'm not drawing that line all the way across. My secondary feathers are going to come down here and this line is going to kind of trail up and then peter out. The primaries stick out underneath that, a nice little angular block, the straight front, and then those disappear into the, some of the chest feathers up here this top edge is covered up underneath scapular feathers here. So that's as much of the wing as I would see. If I want to put a little bit more detail in this, I can suggest to people that these are feathers that are kind of, they're oriented this way. And very often on, <clears throat> on, on many birds, the first three secondary feathers in here are more brightly colored and prominent. And so when you look at the bird, the first, sometimes you see this sort of clear step down of the secondaries have one, two, three big feathers, and then the rest of them are all just things that kind of line up parallel for that. One, two, three. This was drawn from a photograph, by the way. So this was a very, 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 very cooperative bird. Um, so what I'll sometimes do is just sort of suggest the edges of some of those first three feathers and then a little bit of this. And on, uh, so now I'm going to bounce over to this bird and give it a wing. So this bird's, we're gonna have covert feathers that are going to be kind of coming down here. I'm gonna have secondary feathers. The covert feathers, by the way, don't have to be lined up the same. Like these covert feathers are kind of oriented this way. And the secondary feathers are oriented this way. Very often you see these secondary covert feathers, which is what these are, at a slightly different angle than the rest of the feathers. And a little bit of primary extension sticking out there. That gives this, this, this bird just a little bit of nice wing in there. And we'll put patterns into that in a moment. Hey Jack, there's a question that just popped in about, are you noticing this level of detail with the naked eye or do you have time to, need to use binoculars? All right, um, so this, yeah, this is, this is with binoculars. 
And so um, actually the easiest thing to do if you have a spotting scope is to watch your birds through a spotting scope because there's just one uh, few, uh, few piece of gear that you have to hold in your hand. Um, but if you are uh, working with binoculars, uh, hold on, I'm going to change screens here. Got my binoculars here. Then what I will do is I will sit somewhere where I can either have, if I've got a table, I mean, that's, that's great. If there's a little picnic table. Those are wonderful for, for sketching. So you put your little notebook down on the table and you've got your, I'm right-handed. So I'd have my right hand free for that. I usually use lightweight binoculars so they don't jiggle too much. And then what I'm doing is I am, I'll take my lightweight binoculars and I'll brace two fingers against my head like this and look through my binoculars so I can focus them. And then I draw and I keep my hand here and I go back to this. You don't need to be doing this with both of your hands. So if you've got a lightweight pair of binoculars and you're drawing at a table, you just put your elbow down there and then you've got your elbow and your hand braced against your head. If you just do it out here, your, your hand tends to shake too much and it gets jiggly. But this is a great way of observing birds. So you'd be looking at the bird, saying out loud what you see, right? Like it's got real stripes on the back. Oh, on the secondary feathers, there are light edges on those, those first one, two, three. And then the, um, the chest is rather, is, is plain. Oh, there's up on the back, there are some stripes. So I'm actually talking out loud ab about what I see. If nobody is there, um, even if somebody's there, I kind of do it more quietly because people think that you're crazy. Um, by the way, if you put little uh, earphones in, people think you're talking on your phone. <laughs> if you don't want people um, to, 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 to think you're nuts. But I'm actually okay with people thinking I'm nuts. Um, so lightweight binoculars, your hand braced, you know, you're talking to the bird and just if you, it, it's called, this is a kind of an, an interesting um, phenomenon. It's called the production effect. If you say it, you remember those details long enough to get it from there on the bird onto your piece of paper. But if you just look at it, you ever had the experience you're looking at the bird and then you put your binoculars down and you go like, wow, that was neat. Like, can you really describe any of the features? You might be able to recall a couple of the critical field marks that you knew you had to look at. But all the little details in there, they vanish. So instead, what you do is you're looking at the bird, you talk to the bird. Physically saying with your mouth, it, it actually doesn't work to think it and or even kind of, you know, just think those words. You actually have to say them out loud. And that gets those things stuck in your head in a ridiculous way. That then the bird, even if the bird goes away, you'll still have a ton of stuff that you remember. Or the uh, bird may still be there, but you can hold stuff in your head long enough to get it down on, on the piece of paper. I don't have a photographic memory. I've got a memory just like everybody else. Um, and so uh, I use the production effect all the time to help me be able to, to do this. So let's bounce back to this little sparrow buddy here. And we're gonna give it a tail because it wants a tail. And so uh, in, in side view, the, the tail is going to be pretty straightforward. <laughs> it has a tail. There we go. Um, if we're looking at it sort of more from the top or the bottom, um, you know, here we'll look at one from the, the top. You'll often have a tail that um, where you can kind of see the end of it. But that's not so much the angle which we've drawn this bird. I'll, let's just uh, look here for some ends of tail. So here, a little bit kind of looking on it uh, down from the top. Oh, by the way, this one, you can tell that it's drawn from a photo because it says from photo. Most of my stuff is drawn from life, but I didn't want to claim that I saw this bird because it didn't. This was waiting in the airport with my daughters and um, showing them doing a little bird drawing lesson before we kind of arrived in Quito. Um, whoops, wrong way. I drew that page upside down. But see, they, you know, side view 
kind of the straight tail is easy is 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 easy to do. But if um, you're looking at it at more of an angle, so look at this. If the bird's shoulders are at an angle here like this, the bottom of the wingtips are going to be at that same angle, and so is the tail going to be at that same angle. So I get this angle here. How do I get that angle? It's because that's the same angle that you're seeing here across the back of this bird. Um, any other birds want to give us a three? Uh, this, this one you're seeing more of an interesting angle on the tail. So you can see a little bit kind of looking down on it. So if you're not looking straight sideways on something, then, then, I, then, I, then you get more of a, a fun angle. Now, this bird has this kind of fluff pile here underneath its tail. These are called the undertail coverts. You notice I'm doing that same kind of flick in line. Kind of makes this look fluffy. If you, by the way, if you draw your fluffy patch like this, with lines going out, it looks like kind of a weird, um, it doesn't look fluffy. It looks like it's some weird kind of static electricity or a burr that you got in your socks. But if those flick lines go in, you can make them kind of sort of mold into the, 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 the shape of that bird a little bit more easily. You know, put a little flick line in here. Just makes that you know, a little bit fluffy. But if you do it everywhere, then it feels like, <clears throat> Uh, sort of a shaggy dog. Um, this bird is going to have a little bit of gray here on the chest. So notice how I'm kind of curving those lines just sort of lightly. I like drawing either with a, a, a regular pencil or a ballpoint pen because the ballpoint pen allows me to sometimes go hard and I can also go lightly with a ballpoint pen. And so that's, that's, that's useful. Um, I'm going to put in a little hint of some very faint streaking on the lower chest there. And lastly, we're going to go, oh, not lastly, uh, we're going to give this bird feet. Uh, maybe before the, the, the feet, let's give it just a little bit more streakiness because there's streakiness on the wings here, there's streakiness on the back. And there's big streaking here, medium streaking here, and little streaking up here. So what I'm going to do is I've got these three feathers here. Check this out. I'm going to zoom down on this wing. This is, this is kind of a cool trick. Very often you'll see that the outer, these, these, these first secondary feathers on the bird will have light edges. So what I will do is I will think that that feather is roughly occupying that area there. I'm just going to draw dark in on the inside of that. And so if the next feather is in this area here, I'm going to draw dark on the inside of that, leaving the edges and the base. And the same thing here, there's one last big feather. And then I get these light feather edges on those first three uh, things. And then there's gonna be some other edges here that are lighter. So I'm gonna put some darker lines in um, so that you've got these sort of pale edges going down on those secondaries. The primaries don't get that. And then there's gonna be a few dark lines coming in here. And then on the back of the bird, I'm going to have I made those notes that there were streaks on there. So I'll put a few little streaks on this bird's back. And a few mini streaks here on the back of the head. And it's looking, starting to look a lot more kind of sparrowy. The last thing it needs is a little bit of sparrow legs. So if we make this a really cold day, the feet are going to be tucked up closer and hidden in there because you don't want your legs to be really exposed on a cold day. Um, so let's make this a little bit chilly. So I'm going to move my foot. I'm going to move my foot in here. This would be, I could have this be accurate, but I'm going to, I, you can actually, 
have that same bird in its feet up here. And now it'll just look like it's a, just a little bit more kind of fluffed out and kind of uh, it's, it's, feeling, it's feeling chilly. Well, let me show you what I do with these, these, these feet here. Um, you're either gonna be seeing the feet from the front view or the back view. And here, because uh, here we're, we're seeing the, 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 the feet uh, a little bit more of the front view. And so I'm going to have part of the leg come down and it's gonna to widen towards the base of the foot. The back toe is straight and just disappears behind the branch here. But the front toes are going to wrap around here, around the, 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 the front of the branch. And what I recommend people do for drawing um, bird feet is initially just don't overwork them. Um, there are three toes in the front and just kind of keep them a little bit simple. The middle one is a little bit um, longer. And the uh, inner one is a little bit more angular. So the, their inner toes are a little bit more angular. So on this one here, we're gonna have you know, one toe here kind of pretty angular. And then this next toe is gonna wrap around there a little bit more, third one there. But if I get in here and just add a ton of detail in these feet, the only thing that people will look at when they look at this drawing is this bird's feet, because that's where I've just added all the detail. Um, but so just to kind of keep your feet simple, a great exercise to do is just to look at some photographs of bird feet. We can actually have a whole workshop, and I sometimes actually do that on drawing bird feet. Let's get a little bit more of an interesting branch. Little bud sticking out on the side of it because it's winter time. There it is. A little chili sparrow. Um, but it was built up from a little framework. Um, so now what I'm going to do is just do the same thing, but with but faster with a wren and um, and then even faster with a quick sketch of a scrub jay. Um, so if this one here wants to be a little winter wren, I know that this is about desert birds, but I kind of, I, I, it's best for me to kind of go with the birds that I know the best. Um, they've got short primary extension there's super fuzz balls, big old head. And let's kind of get maybe part of maybe this tail sticking out, a little bit of undertail coverts. So really quick on this, different kind of bird we would have a different kind of beak. So I always look at what sort of beak shape do you have? It was interesting when I was in Ecuador because I just didn't know these birds. I would often start with the wrong beak shape on my birds. And so really had to kind of come back and modify those like the first time, like this toucan barbet has, has it's got a pretty big bill, right? Um, but then, you know, you compare that with the toucan barbet I saw later and just realized that you got a ridiculous bill. <laughs> like, that's, that's crazy, Bill. That's crazy. Ah, what's up with that? This one would give me a better look, right? Um, but you know, sometimes I make the bill the wrong shape, and that's okay. You just do the best you can. But looking at something like bill shape is going to make you a better birder. This little bird, let's give it a big eye here so it feels like it is a wren. Smaller birds have proportionately larger heads and they also have proportionately larger eyes. And that's one of the reasons why they look so cute. Let's 
fuzz ball. Let's give it a, to make this a little bit fluffier. Front of the wing often kind of just kind of the feathers fluff up and the wing just hides under those. So it's got a big block of secondaries with a little tab of primaries hanging down from that. And we're gonna put a little bit of feathers out onto the top of the tail here, which is gonna be short. So I'm from an angle here. And then there's going to be a little bit of nice fluffiness on those undertail coverts. Big wren. Here is you're going to have a little branch like this. Your back toe has a claw on it, and here's your French toe. It's going to your toes are kind of wrapping around here. If you're making a fast sketch, you know, don't put too much detail into your very often we put the most detail where we feel the most insecure. The part of the wing on the other side. And a little bit of shading rounds this thing out. It's overall a dark bird. Each of these little pads of feathers is its own little unit. And uh, make it look really renny, it gets a stripey wing. So I'm going to put in just a little bit of stripage in here. A little bit across these covert feathers here. And a little bit in the tail. Lastly, we've got this one. This one's gonna be a scrub jay. So I'm gonna give it a longer tail. This one's gonna be looking towards me a little bit. I'll show you how to do that. So to make it looking towards me, if its beak in profile is this long, when it's looking towards me, its beak is going to appear shorter. So this bird's beak is going to be in here. The side of the head that is away from you doesn't come down to where the beak attaches here on the sort of profile thing. Instead, it's going to be further out along the beak because this thing is turned towards us. So you see how the base of the beak is down in here and then the side of the head is over there. So just move that there, give it a flat side there, and then I round this side of the head. And this bird is then looking towards me just a little bit. And it's got a white line above its eye.
keep that wing simple. And this bird's foot is like way up here. It's holding onto a branch. And this other one, it's not going to be cold. It's the other one is sticking down. You're seeing a little bit of its heel. And I'll often kind of draw on the uh, uh, bird, put the bird's feet in first and then draw the branch up to, to kind of connect those feet. We're looking at the underside of the tail. And maybe it's got wings on the other side, but so that other wing, if this one is here, the other wing would be kind of sticking out there. There we go. Little scrub jay up on a perch looking for where this one wants to put its uh, nest. Come on back later and get a snack there. Some people don't like the scrub jay because uh, they eat little birdies and have eggs. Um, you realize you didn't have that scrub jay? Goodbye, oak forests. This is the character who plants our oak forests all over the, our, our, our region here. Thank you, scrub jay. I am forever in your debt. I like the oak trees. So what I've got then is an approach of initially kind of blocking this thing in. And uh, as I'm looking at my birds, I'm talking out loud to them helps me remember the details that I see. And then I am, uh, I am using my, uh, the notes which I take all over the page to kind of get all those little details. This is kind of a useful framework for starting off putting birds into your book. Initially, I recommend that people just focus on profiles. So you see a bird, give yourself just a kind of a quick little frame like this. Oh, let's zoom down on that. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Frame one more time. Kind of quick bird frame. The bird gets a, a back line, it gets an eye beak line, it gets that front angle, it gets side there. It's going to be. Uh, you know, you've got this basic setup for your bird. Don't worry about having to make this bird look perfect. If you have written notes in here that says, you know, you know, long beak, um, whatever it is that you Remember, put those little notes in. Use your words and pictures together. But you're going to find that when you start to, when you start to put your these uh, pictures in, it will change the way that you think about the bird. It will change the way that you see the bird, and that makes a real difference. Uh, drawing is a way of seeing. It's a way of thinking. And drawing is not a gift that some people have and um, other people don't. It's a skill that you develop just by putting in, by drawing more birds. If you start drawing birds on a regular basis this year, by this time next year, you are going to be making really, really solid bird drawings. And if you don't believe me, this comes with a guarantee. Um, Cheryl, what I suggest is that 
at least one year from now, we do part two of this. And in between now and then, I'm going to suggest that everybody here just get your bird drawing on. If you go to my website, johnmirlaws.com, that's johnmirlaws.com, there are tons of free bird drawing tutorials that are either done live or I've recorded them in another live thing and give lots of tips and techniques. They're ones where I get into all the details of like beaks and like heads and feather tracks and all that sort of stuff. Um, If you throw yourself into drawing birds and you fill up a journal or two with sketches of birds, and by this time next year, you look at your stuff and you go like, Jack was wrong. I didn't get better. Come back on the show and say, Jack, look, I made all these drawings and I didn't get better. And I will then give you free drawing lessons until we can figure out personal ones, until we can figure out what is going on there, because you will be a neurological anom anomaly that I will be absolutely fascinated with. You absolutely can do this. And if you start now just drawing a bunch of birds, it's gonna happen. Now somebody's asking, uh, is it okay to draw from photographs and pictures? Yes, absolutely, and I do it all the time. It's great. I'm gonna suggest to you two websites um, that are terrific um uh, for for getting these these are birdpixel.com birdpixel.com and seeingbirds.com so birdpixel.com and seeingbirds.com oh thank you uh, Ivea for putting those in the chat um actually Ivea I didn't know you were here I'm going to try to make you a co-host if I can see you I'm not going to do that right now because I can't find you. Um, but but you can absolutely do this. So this, the secret is pencil miles. So you you draw one, you draw another, you draw another, you draw another, you draw another. And after that, what do you do? Oh, yeah, you draw another. So is it OK to work from photographs? Yes, it's great to work from photographs. Is it OK to work from life? Yes, it's great to work from life. All right. Is it OK to work from memory? You know what I'm going to say. All right. It's not that one of these is, you know, that, that like there's the, the only way to do it. Whatever gets you doing it is going to to work. Um, the so we've we've got if you go. Yeah, somebody uh, somebody uh, Sarah's pointing out that there's a community calendar. Um, Avea, could you put up the link to the community calendar? Um, you're going to see that there's in the nature journaling community. Um, we don't just draw birds, but there's people doing all sorts of kind of cool nature explorations. There is a large growing community of people who are um, who can become your mentors, who will walk you through the process of learning to understand, to see birds, to draw them or flowers. Um, and it is really, really fun. It is really, really fun. So check out birdpixel and seeingbirds.com. You can, um, the, the photographers and those, uh, you know, some people, they, they say, please don't. Yeah, I, I don't want anybody using my stuff and then drawing pictures from it because I feel like you're violating my, you know, this is this is this is my thing, um, and that's totally cool. But um, Ashok Kasala and Vivek Kanzode of those two websites, they say like, come on, use these, get inspired about birds, learn about birds. They've invited this whole community to come in and use all those resources for that. So. Thanks, guys. <laughs> it's really, really helpful. Um, uh, are there any questions that popped up? That... There are, Jack. I'm, I'm scrolled back to the beginning of the questions. The very first one, Taylor asked, and you may have covered it, says, does the head axle and the body axle line line up together, or is it two separate lines, or two separate ones? Yeah, so... Um, if, if you look on this bird here, its head is sticking up like that and its body is in an angle like that. So this one doesn't. On this bird, it does. So depending on how they're holding their body, um, it, it's, it's going to change. Um, I used to just start by drawing the axis of the major kind of core of the body. But then a lot of people got confused about that sort of axis and angle of the head. That's another reason why I like that strategy of initially looking at the shape of the air on the back of the bird. Um, this one is just a flat 
surface across the back of this thorn. And um, so you, if you get that angle in, it will place your head in the right relationship to um, the, 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 the body. Um, the, uh, somebody's asking about good site for wildflower picks. Um, here in California, we have Cal, Cal photo. Cal flora is the, so help me out of it if you know. The, um, there, there is a site for lots of botanical picks, um, but that, that's a California one. So I don't know for whatever reason, region um, other folks may be in. Um, are, are there other questions about the birdies? There are, let's see, hang on, I've just lost my spot. Um, someone says, what about flat feet, just not do the ball? Oh yeah, so if they're like, on, if they're on the ground, I guess. Yeah, let, let's 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 draw a little bird hopping around on the ground. Okay. Um, and also, I can just show you some sketches that I've done of those. Um, I have some workshops where it was, it was all about bird feet, but here is uh, just you know, some quick bird footiness. Um, let's see. In here. So this, this bird was hopping around on the ground. And so you see on this one here, um, you've got three forward, one back. There's sort of a larger claw in the back. Very often you don't see all the toes, especially that one that's on the farthest side from you. So I like this foot here. This foot, this back one especially is really kind of working for me where yeah, there are three toes there, but I don't see one. So you don't have to draw it. Here in this quick little sketch in this side view, look at how sort of simplified that foot is. It is kind of a foot going down to where it connects here. There's a claw on the back toe, the back toe is straight, but I'm not kind of getting lost in the weeds um, uh, having to do that. Sometimes when the bird's feet are on the ground, you cannot see the whole foot. So when you can't see the whole foot, don't draw the whole foot. If you can, um, but notice like this is just this is loosely handled, so it doesn't say look right here. If I get in here and I draw in all the scales on the foot, first of all, it's hard to see those through my binoculars. Um, I can barely sort of see like oh the feet are kind of flat here, so that that's that's what, how I'm handling those. Uh, let's see if there's any other feet on the ground. Um, yeah, here's here's another one. So this this bird's feet are on the ground here. Um, go to some of uh, here's one more thing. Check out these crazy things. These are ant pittas. And so here's a foot coming towards you that is on the ground. Hmm. And notice just how that I'm not really over, whoops, let's go the other way. Not really overworking that. Just that there's a toe that is coming towards you here. Oh no, a foreshortened toe. I'm just kind of keeping that simple. This one here, I can't really see its feet very well. So I don't draw its feet. And certainly if it's standing in water, <laughs> you don't have to draw the feet at all. Okay. Someone uh, wants to know what size lead you have on your pin, pintail twisty race. Um, so I use for my sketching um, two sizes. Um, if I'm doing stuff with black graphite, I will use a 0.5 and a 0.7. Um, I really, really like, oh, let's go this way. I really, really like the big thick line I get with that 0.7. Um, let me just sort of show you why that's just, it gives you this really uh, luscious, luscious line. Um, you know, you can, you can very quickly fill up a space with value and tone. Um, and uh, when you, uh, you, you, you press harder, it kind of gives you the, it, it allows you to kind of get a darker mark. So it can go 
if I flick it, I can get a, it going to a light line, but I can also very quickly have a uh, light line. For the, 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 the twist erase that was the one with that colored lead in it, um, for that initial kind of quick sketch, that was a 0.5. Um, but okay. I really love if I'm doing graphite drawings, the feeling of the 0.7 is uh, is really fun. Someone wants to know, there's a couple more questions. Do you normally add some color while you're sketching or later? Um, it depends on the uh, on how much time I have. Sometimes if I'm doing kind of if I'm if I'm speed drawing. I don't have time to do everything. And um, the, let me just sort of demo kind of quick color. Um, my approach to color is um, I've got a set of watercolors that I usually bring with me in the field. And you're thinking that watercolors, that's not going to work at all because, um, you know, you've got them waiting for all this stuff to dry. Um, the, uh, but let me just, uh, show you how it actually can be kind of fast. I have a brush here with water inside its handle. Ooh. That's kind of cool. It's called a water brush, and you can get those on johnmirlaws.com. Um, and the way that it, that it works is uh, I rub my palette, and then I've got paint on my brush. Um, this bird now has some gray here and some gray here and a little bit up there, and maybe a little bit there. And let's put some brown on there. And now I'm going into brown because I think I want it to be a little bit more of that. And uh, okay, that's better. And then the, um, maybe a little bit of that up to there. We're gonna put a little bit of, see what I just did? I've got a, a sock on my wrist here. And I just give it a squeeze and a wipe on that sock. And now my brush is clean. And so I can go back, put a little bit of gray in the cheek here. And I'm gonna put a lot more gray right around that white spot on the throat because that then that white throat really pops out more. And then I'm gonna get a little bit of darker brown and mix that with a little bit of gray. And I've got tail feathers and clean it again, wipe it on my sock. Love the eyes. Oh yeah, well the, the eyes are critical. The eyes, the little <laughs> googly eyes on the, the wiping sock are really important. And the reason is that you never know when you need a sock puppet. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Always ready. Yeah, o always ready to have a sock puppet. You got to have a sock puppet. Easy to um, So yeah, just the addition for the googly eyes and instant sock puppet. And life's better with sock puppets. Um, and let's see. I get a little bit of light color on the beak and then give this sparrow just a little bit of yellow above its eye. There's a white throated sparrow. Ta -da. Um, maybe I can give some of those dark lines a little bit. Well, while you're spiffing them up, somebody wants to know what brand of ballpoint pen you were using. Um, yeah, that's a really good question because not all ballpoint. So what I find is that very often some of the cheapest ballpoint pens, like a big round stick, are great. You know, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of pens that they have in Motel 6, right, are terrific. Um, uh, 
um, the uh, uh, the pen that I was using there is a Bic Atlantis, and I like those as uh, if you want a disposable ballpoint pen, Bic Atlantis. They make a solid pen. Okay, let me see if while well, you're bluing him up, let me see what else people were dying to know. I want to mention, um, I wrote it in the chat, but check out johnmuirlaws.com and um, Jack's book on uh, the Laws Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling is there. You can get his bird drawing book that uh, my friend Ellen, who's out there somewhere, borrowed and has been having fun with. Um, <laughs> and so much more all those videos that that jack mentioned but a list of the materials that he uses so that if you're wondering for more tips about pins and brushes and and all that he has ideas for that um let's see questions someone said do you suggest practicing and getting to know your birds from pictures and you said draw from pictures but like if when you were going to go to some place you'd never been, like when you went to South America, did you pre-practice or did you practice in advance drawing some of those birds? I think that the, the best thing to do is to practice with the birds that are convenient and close to you. So if you have, um, you know, house finches nearby, get to know your house finches really, really well. Learn. Um, learn how, you know, what are the general proportions on that bird? Learn how the, the little patterns of stripes go on the females. And that will then spill over into all the rest of the birds that you draw and encounter. Um, so it's, it's not so much that there's like a technique for drawing a scrub jay, but the scrub jay um, is informed by, you know, if, if you've got juncos near you, go junco crazy. Do tons of juncos. And what's going to happen then is that the junco then becomes kind of your baseline bird, the bird that you know really well. And then when you look at a bird, you go like, wow, it's got a really large head proportionally relative to the junco. But because you put in all those miles, pencil miles, sketching the junco, um, it is, it's, it's, it's wonderful. The junco then informs, like, so I practice drawing all these other birds, that, all the birds of Ecuador, by drawing all the birds right in my backyard. And then when I got there, it's just, you know, it's all, all these wonderfully different things. But I am, uh, but, uh, but I get there, by, um, but my, my approach to that is the same as I would do with my scrub jig. But because I've drawn all my scrub jigs, then it's going to help me kind of you know handle these 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 next these 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 novelties. Okay, I think we hit pretty much all of the questions people had. Someone said, "What about a non-disposable pen that you recommend?" Um, but I think that would probably be on your website. Now, um, I have, I've been trying and messing with, with uh, some things. Um, for a um, non-disposable pen, um, here is a non-disposable fountain pen. Down a little bit, we can't see. Um, it is the preppy. The preppy okay, fine. We can't see it. Not the, oops, oops, sorry about that. This is the preppy. Um, it's the preppy fine, not the pre preppy extra fine fountain pen. Um, the uh, I now other people have other fountain pens that they suggest. Like there's one called the Lamy Artist's Pen, um, but I got one of those and it clogged really fast. And this one hasn't clogged yet, and I really like that. And it might be that I just didn't treat my other pen right and just you know did something wrong with it, but. But this little one has been been really kind of chuffing along, and um, and and I do like it. Um, of the 
fountain pens uh, that are, are replaceable. Um, and then there's different ways that you can do it, depending on how far you want to go with replacing these things. You can buy inserts for fountain pens that allow you to refill them from ink, and others, there are disposable cartridges. So if you want to totally eliminate all the disposable things, then um, uh, you can buy these, these fountain pens with sort of rechargeable um, inserts in them. And others, they're, they're just little cartridges that you snap into it. Okay, cool. And then I think maybe to wrap us up, um, we have had a request from Tina that we recap the three fast approach sentences. Oh, um, let's see. I would say first step, um, observe the bird and talk to the bird. Right? That really, really is, is, is important. So observe the bird and talk to the bird. Um, then I would go in by blocking in lightly, and I will often use a light colored colored pencil. Lightly block in that basic shape, and let's review that approach again. Um, sort of, if I broke it down, my initial uh, kind of critical steps into four, I would start with that kind of line along the back. And what is the, the shape of the air against the back of the bird? Um, I'm then blocking in the shape of the head and what direction the bird is looking. Then the shape of the air on the throat and the front of its chest. Once I get those lines, I'm, I've got so much information recorded. Other steps from there is to block in the oval of the body of the bird figure out which way its tail is pointed. Let's give this one a really long tail. And whether it's got the wings drooped or tucked. I'm gonna tuck this wing. Feet come out at a forward angle. And that is, that's my, my basic, my basic formula for my bird. I'm now going to take my uh, 0.7 millimeter uh, graphite pencil and just kind of have a little bit of fun with this. Um, and Jack, while you're drawing him in, are you going to put the recording from this session on your website or someplace people can find it? Absolutely. Okay, so at johnmirlaws.com? Yep, so we'll have a recording of this session on johnmirlaws.com. And uh, you'll also will find there recordings of lots of other past sessions of, um, of other workshops on all sorts of different topics. Um, also, I really strongly suggest that people check out um, the uh, check out the, um, the, the offerings from other instructors uh, in the Nature Journal uh, community. There really is a, there's a wonderful and generous uh, uh, a bunch of, of, of resources that you can find there. And if it's possible, support those people with a donation. Um, the, uh, it's, it's really, uh, there, there's, there's, there's a, a, a real, richness of material and we want to kind of help those people um, but that's a wonderful uh, thing to, to to check out and then you know i don't want to neglect to have you give a very quick plug for the wild wonders online conference uh oh yes let me tell everybody about wild wonder um whoopie doo let me go back to the jack cam here Hi, it's Jack. Um, so the, the Wild Wonder um, Nature Journaling Conference um, is a international gathering of amazing inspired um, nature geeks um, who use journals to draw, document, and describe all the phenomena that they find. And um, last couple of years, it's been online. Our first one before that was pre-COVID. <laughs> and um, at some point, we will be back 
having live ones. It's just not safe right now. Um, but we hope that um, we can get a handle on this thing. Um, but there are wonderful teachers from all over the world. And when you see, if you just kind of watch one person do their approach to nature journaling, you think to yourself like, oh, that's the right way to do it. Right. But once you see all these different ways and approaches, you're like, oh, you really spark me. You know, you, I really, really dig the way that you, 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 you do that. Um, you've seen some comments um, from Ivea Moore, uh, the mad botanist. Um, she is a really active part of that community. Um, the, uh, and uh, she teaches tons of, of, of classes on, on, on botany for, for nature journalers and curious people. Um, there's, 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 there's a lot of really fun things that you can find. Um, and what, what month is it? Um, oh, I'm dyslexic. I, I <laughs> have a chat. card in my wallet chat. to remind me what my telephone number is. Yep. So September, Penelope oh. has said it's September. Penelope, thank you. The 18th. Yeah, September. That sounds great. And then um, there's a quick, oh, let's see. Wait a minute. There was a, what is, I, I heard you say it. I'm going to say it wrong. Avia's website contact. Oh, um, so what you do is go to, you can find her uh, several ways. The easiest way is you go to johnmirlaws.com and go to the community calendar. And then you can find like one that she teaches these awesome things. We call it pencil. She calls it pencil miles and chill. And it's just like low pressure and people just sort of showing up, having rich conversations about books while nature journaling together. Sometimes they're finishing drawings and having talks about things and um, and other classes that she teaches um, are are this these these uh, like botany um, edible botany, botany in your kitchen, botany, uh, edible plants. Um, uh, also, <laughs> I want to let people know about the Nature Journal Club. And the Nature Journal Club is a ton of fun. It's an international group of people who are doing nature journaling, and then they share all their stuff with each other. And so you, if you're inspired looking at, say, my drawings, what would it be like to be looking at the sketches and drawings of about 40,000 different nature journalers over the world? So people are loading their things. I know there's a lot of problems with Facebook. I know, I know. Um, but the uh, we're using Facebook as a free platform um, that where you can kind of go into that club and see all these different pages of journals from from everybody and, and what we do is we encourage people like you see somebody doing something you like you know engage them in a conversation about it and then start using those strategies and ideas it's not like no this is my idea you can't use it it's a really generous community that way so the nature journal club on facebook a lot of people also will publish uh, uh post their classes um free low cost and cost ones um, on there. So you can check out the Nature Journal Club on, on, on Facebook. So it's, it's, it's not like uh, there's, there's nothing political going on on it. Um, we've decided that we're going to make it a space for talking about art and nature journaling. Um, the politics of our society and world are important. We're just intentionally not doing it there. Um, and um, everybody, there's, there's, there's nothing like you don't have to, like, what do you do? Like, how do you get in this club? You just kind of like, yeah, I want to do it. Um, and uh, then you're in. And it's called on Facebook, it is The Nature Journal Club. Yes, that's right. So I have it open right now. Well, Jack, this has been awesome. It has been the pleasure of the Messiah Valley Audubon Society to, to sponsor and, and host today's event. And I was making a list that we had people from El, Sal El Salvador, Japan, Australia, Minnesota, Seattle, Washington, Louisiana, North Carolina, Alabama, Virginia, New York, Wash or Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Toronto, Canada, uh, Washington, New Mexico, California, and probably some that I missed. But oh. um, it, it's just, it's been great. I hope people had found some ideas about things that they would like to do or find, found some confidence in drawing birds and that you check out nature journaling as well. And I wanna thank the, uh, the Sea Valley Audubon Society board members and 
and club members that I see in the meeting today for being part of it and to everybody from around the world. Well, thank you so much for hosting us. Again, I want to encourage people to support your local chapter of the Audubon Society. Do you want to uh, drop um, into the chat? I um, did, I'll do it again real quick. The, uh, the URL for this organization, here it comes, there it is. Oh, thank you. Um, and, or your own. Uh, there, there, there's also a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's an active chapter in your backyard. And, um, you know, this world is beautiful. This world is amazing. The more we open up our eyes and look at it, the more astonished you're going to be. And um, I want to just encourage to people to kind of go out um, in, uh, into this beautiful world, soak it up, celebrate it, and then let's come together as a community to protect and preserve the amazing natural resources and, and riches of this planet. It is not just a responsibility that you have, it's a privilege that we get to step forward in this world as stewards. And I want to invite everybody to join um, our local chapters of Audubon um, and others around the world in protecting our wild places and spaces, as well as the people that there and dwell. So thank you all for being here. Be well, be safe, go play with birds, make a sketch, and then another, and then another. And I'll see you back here next year, if not before. Absolutely. Thank you, Jack. I see rounds of applause going on. Out hey. there. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I'm going to bounce over to the gallery view so I can see all your faces. Oh, look at that. Hey, thank you folks so much for being here. Look at him. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> Great to see you. Hey, Sid. Ivea, thank you for your help in the chat. Here's Annie. Annie just coordinated getting our Lucia Valley Audubon Society t-shirts made, our winter t-shirts, which oh. I didn't wear. I should have worn our Audubon Society t-shirt. Oh, let's let's see. Oh, there oh, it is, right oh, there. Oh, I'm going is to, I'm gonna spotlight. Hold on. Uh, it there here, it is, um, Annie, and we can even uh, invite you to unmute if you want to tell people about this. If buying, will buying one of these shir shirts also help support the chapter? Yes, and actually, we only have like two more left for sale. We ordered extras. <laughs> But people are coming to get their sweatshirts and they are, um, here's the sweatshirt and they're buying the t-shirts. So I think I have one large and one small. Oh, one. that's great. Can you see yes, the you know, that as, as logos go, and that is right? such a solid logo. I really like, so now whoever that was designed graphic... by Cheryl. Cheryl helped Cheryl, us that's your design? design? Well, okay, so the roadrunner was um, stock that. art, but I put it together as a logo. I like it. And we have two sweatshirts left, a large <laughs> and an extra large for sale. They're $40, t-shirts are 25. And those of you who haven't come to pick up your stuff, let me know when you can come. I'm coming, I'm coming. You're so far Otherwise, away. Otherwise it's sitting in oh Annie's garage and that's just, that's not uh, sitting in my spare bedroom with the door shut so the cats can't climb on them. that's right pick up your sweatshirt <laughs> before the cat sits on it <laughs> and then let that cat get free roam of the house again yeah. um so i remember when you're you're uh, uh you know uh buying those t-shirts that that's also supporting these sorts of education and conservation projects that the uh that the society puts on so thank you also for supporting. Absolutely. Yeah, in fact, our group just um, worked together to put a bird blind up at a local state park. And so we're, we're raising money for the signage to go near the bird blind. But it was a big project that um, Sid, uh, Sid's still here. Sid was very involved in. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And there's a note here that you should read from Kristen that's to you about your book. Oh, oh, 
Oh, Merry Christmas there, Kristen. <laughs> That's great. I see it. Well, folks, it's been awesome to have such a, a wonderful international group and of all ages. I'm, I'm seeing that we have from, from young nature artists to more senior nature artists, at least in terms of age, maybe not in terms of experience, but oh, uh, oh look, and we've got some pictures being held up. Um, uh, Gary, could we check that out again? Oh, and that's not really Gary, what she oh, 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 uh, here of in the chat. The, um, oh, okay, there. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Camille. Camille says it's not really Gary, it's Camille. No, that's really fun. Kate um, has one too. Uh, so we can also uh, allow you to unmute here if you want to. Uh, hold on, I just, we'll try that again. There we go. Okay. So um, it, oh, that's a really, really fun. Ooh. Could, could you hold that, that's the, some of those sketches up again? Is that Courtney there? Or is that Courtney's Zoom that you're using? Uh, oh, that's really, really fun. That is really cool. But yeah, you've got the angles on that little, the, on those birds so, uh, so wonderfully. And Kate's, Kate's holding one up. This was great. I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for being here. Um, um, Diane, were you holding one up a moment ago? Um, yeah, let me bring you on. Oh. And we'll, um, bring Diane in on here. Ah, there's our little wren. There's Diane our little is red the friend, that, of the that stubby little tail. That's great. Diane is our, our treasure of our chapter. Great. Uh, let's uh, hold on. I still on. want to see Courtney. Is it Courtney or not Courtney? There we go. Oh, that, so, uh, Diane, did you want to say something? Or? Oh, no, sorry, Diane. No, it's just, I, I was very skeptical <laughs> about trying this. <laughs> but, um, but you said it would, I, I would get better. So, I'm going to hold. Yeah. That, that, that's right. No, no. And, and so, Diane, I'm serious about this. Give it a year of drawing dangerously, and then let's meet back here and you tell me what happened. Okay. All right. Okay. That's my challenge for you. And I've got a bunch of free resources to help you out, but I am good for this. If, if you dive in and you give it the, the, the time and the pencil miles and it doesn't crystallize for you, um, you've got a tutor. Okay. And don't, don't pretend, Diane. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, this is just, it's all on the honor system. Thank you. And, and Diane, I did mention to Jack, we were talking about maybe we could form a nature journal group here in Las Cruces, so. I would love that, because I'm going to need help. Oh, that's great. Um, let's see. Um, this is really fun. Um, did anybody else want to, hey, Kate, could we see what you're up to? Oh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Oh, always. So I've been waiting because I have a journal that's full of birds where I just did the thing where I put in the pencil miles and I think it kind of shows the improvement. I just filled one up. So if oh, you guys want to see- We do, the we do. I'm, from I'm, the last of, I'm, month. I'm shutting everybody else down to make your screen bigger here. And we'd okay. love to do a journal flip with you, Kate. Okay, well. You guys are in for a treat because I've got a full sketchbook for you guys. So this oh. is just my grandfather's backyard. Oh. I'm sure you can recognize some of the California species, a really yes. ancient dog. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, you, you've got my scrub jay there. I love those birds. And yeah. that, 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 that little angle on the tail is just so scrub jay -y. Oh, and then you get down to the coast. I did, yeah. I love the oyster catchers. And the thing is, I just kept... Well, I go with my family usually, so I bring my camera and I take as many pictures as possible and then I'll come back home and draw them. That's a great exercise. Yeah. I want to try drawing more in person, but, um, you know, if you're with people, it kind of drives them crazy. So I've got the bottom <laughs> stuff there too. Uh, so everybody you're looking at, Kate is showing us here pencil miles. So yeah. these are pencil and brush miles. The more well, you do, the more birds. you do. In the garden, this is often what like in-person sketching looks like yes. because you've only got a moment. So you take down the angles and kind of some arrows to show movement. Yep. I think some of these are some pictures, some of them, there's just birds everywhere. My grandfather feeds them every day, twice a day. So if you go out, there's always birds. Some of them are from pictures. I just, I've been constantly drawing birds for a month. I probably put in maybe four to six hours a day every day doing this. 
Um, that is fantastic. And, and it, it, isn't it, it's paying off. You're, you, yeah, you can see so. the changes. Oh. I just doing tons and tons. Um, and then I got, you know, they start to look a little more bird-like. Yes. Wait, 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 go back, 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 go back. Oh, just these little angles of the head. Right. Just sort of nuances of just the, the life is in your pencil. Yeah. And then, well, my sister and my grandfather were both avid birders and my sister isn't afraid to critique me. So she looked at that and go, those birds' heads are too big. It's like, damn it, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> Claire, keep yeah. pushing the envelope with Kate here. Yeah. We're encouraging you. Oh, look at the, yeah. oh, here. the goldfinches. Oh, what fun. Yeah. So you just be at your feeder and you've got this, this oh, smorgasbord in front of you. Yeah, some of these are from pictures too. I think these are all from the feeder. Got the thrasher there. Um, some of them I'll just do like these ones. I pick a species like snow bunting, uh, common loon. Oh. And just withdraw. Wait, 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 wait. Hold that. Go, go back there. Just hold this. Let's just pause on this. So you can see as we're this far into the book, you can see the development and how just like the lines of these things, like these just feel so loony. Yeah. And uh, just... we're only about a third of the way through there. So here, let me give you another page. We get to the flickers. Oh, yeah. Um. Oh, I did one of peacocks, but don't have peacocks here. Oh, that's you know. fun. And just it that splash kind of, of, isn't that splash of color just delightful? And the nice thing about, I really, I've really been loving the shorebirds because they've got such unique shapes. Mm -hmm. You've got that shorebird forehead. They've got really steep foreheads. And yeah. really captured that look. Um, let's see. I think this was the product of, I wasn't happy with the J I made in the class I took from you, so I had to go and redo them and... Oh. oh, this is wow. so, isn't that crazy? Wow. Oh man, oh man, you, you can just see the birds getting better as she flips forward in the book, right? And see what, people Let's think it's a see. gift. No. No, it's not, it's time. Yes, that's okay. right. Um... It is time, it is time and work. So this is what we call neuroplasticity. It's not the brain you're born with. It is the brain that you create through the actions that you take. Oh yeah, like I was watching coots and they have such a weird shape. So I kept going and it took me three pages before I got, it's too bad my, um, I have another sketchbook that has a painting of the coots when I finally, like I did another painting, but I mm -hmm. did so many coots before the coots started to look coot-like. Yep. And then <laughs> and the coots- took like, 30 of and, them. Nope, and then the coot just starts to, <laughs> yes, yes. So, oh, so wait, but, more. Never and, mind. And everybody think of how friend. different this is than, oh, I've seen that bird before. I've got it. Right. Yeah. Totally different. Uh, let's see. More short, short birds. Oh, nice. Wimbrel time. Oh boy. Yeah. I love how you mm. just identify mm. these. From. Mm. <laughs> seagulls starting to do birds in flight um and i sort of go back and forth between a nice watercolor sketchbook and then doing one where i don't feel bad just doing pages of pencil yeah yeah Th there's no better thing you could do with a with a bunch of paper like if you want to save and conserve paper then just reduce junk mail that comes into your head uh, into right. your into well, your house like but if i fill up a sketchbook even if it's with sketches that you know aren't great works of art, you can still learn a lot. And I really enjoy going back and looking at them. Mm -hmm. And I always send my sketchbooks off to my partner. Um, oh, here's some where I got a, a brush pen and just tried to draw birds just with those. Oh, oh, I mean, this is, this, you're seeing pencil miles here, everybody. This is, this is pencil miles in action. Let's see. And you, and, and the same will happen for you. The same will happen for you, whoever you are out there watching this. Those aren't birds, but you know, yeah. one of the things I did was I started asking people to give me daily prompts. Um, so this one was cave and I kind of went overboard that with that one, but um, just trying to put in like shape and figure. There are more birds, I promise. Um, I've got albatross. 
Oh. Hey, are you familiar with John Busby? Is he the one whose book you showed me with the birds in the different scenes? Um, I may have shown a bunch of books, but I'm I I John Busby. Um, it was a was a Scottish um, bird artist whose line really captures the life of birds. And I see um, the things that I really like about his stuff, I also see in your work. Give us one more, give us one more. Keep going. Okay, I don't have any birds, but I've got some deep sea fish from Mbari's Instagram. Ah! <laughs> yeah. And I do have an art Instagram that's just art, nothing else, um, if anyone's interested. Yeah. I can put that in the chat, but Please do. there's always some stuff. And then here's the stuff from during this class. There's a Townsend's Warbler we saw uh while bird watching the other day so trying to get back into like doing more painting stuff with the birds and the songbirds that that's is kind of all i've got that is that's all you got oh that's all i've got not very much sorry yeah i mean <laughs> i mean oh how fun is that that is that's just absolutely delightful thank you so much for 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 sharing that yeah, of <laughs> that's that is so inspiring you know you really just sort of see what happens when you do one and then you do the next and then after that you do the next and then after that doing the next and also it's interesting what you're you're doing there um as something starts to really click you're keeping you you're just sort of up, ratcheting up the level of challenge for yourself mm -hmm. like these birds are flowing i'm going to go for a different taxa of birds Right now yeah. I've got coots. I'm going to go for you know different sorts of organisms. Now let's just bounce over to albatross. Let's go to caves, right? Right. Well, things that let's I kind go to, of do or brush find, pan. Yeah. Well, I just try and find stuff that's going to force me to work on a certain thing. Like thing with caves, that was just something random. My girlfriend came up, but what it did was I just taken a little short YouTube class on um, drawing with perspective and creating that like depth of field. And so I figured I can use that in there. And then with the birds, it's always mostly about line and shape, but then also I took a class about how to look at um, creating rounded objects and how to look at how light reflects light and shadow. Yeah. Um, and so I always try and find things that, like, how can I apply this to something that I'll stay interested in? And for me, the challenge has always just been don't get caught up in scrolling, looking for like a reference picture. That's why I love bird pixels. You can just go find um, a species or you know a family and you can go through that and there's just image after image after image and I just try and draw them facing any direction usually sideways for birds because you know that's most convenient but yeah if you can find a good like stock image source just go through that and just keep clicking through and drawing try and keep the drawings like maybe 30 seconds to a minute and then move on to the next one that's great and, exercise. Um, yeah yeah <clears throat> And so the, the big message that we're, we're seeing here is that this is something that, that you can do. Again, yes. our brains change based on, oh, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna minimize my screen. Yeah, I'll put these up for you guys. Uh, remove spotlight, there we go. Oh, uh, yeah. Our brains changed based on um, repetition with effort. And so you put in those, that work and you are building all sorts of networks of new neural connections in your brain that's this is so exciting this is so yeah. exciting well that and then you can compare it with like trying to learn stuff about new species and you know try and put notes i need to get better at putting new notes and like trying to incorporate incorporate the learning thing in there with it so i can kind of exercise multiple areas of my brain but you know trying to put in as many hours as possible and doing some classes. There's a really great thing, uh, I think it's called Domestica or something. It's a, um, they've got all these short little art classes. They do cost money, but they're pretty cheap. And they do these little courses um, that I've been taking and they kind of really put you through all these exercises, which is kind of cool. Wow, that's really fun. Thank you so much. That, yeah, that is. Thanks that's 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 just crazy cool well, thank you um 
just uh, bouncing over. See, is there anybody else that wanted to share something before we close the meeting out? I think a lot of people have gone to bed here. All right. In lieu of that, um, folks, thank you so much for being here. Um, and um, just uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you in the field. Be safe, be kind, make art, celebrate birds, and we can do this together. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>